It is a great honor to address the Independent Institute. I'm familiar with your work. I've known of David for years. I'd like to talk. You know, you've invited a philosopher to lunch. So the reminds me of that old joke. The uh, the guy sitting on an airplane and he sees this woman sitting next to him. She got a she got an enormous diamond on her ring. Uh, an enormous diamond ring on her finger, and he says, "Oh my gosh, madam, that is the greatest diamond I've ever seen." She says, "Oh, this, this." This is the Klopfield diamond, the world famous Klopfield diamond. He says, really? She says, yes, and it comes with the Klopfield curse. He says, what's that? She says, Mr. Klopfield. <laughs> <laughs> so you've, you've invited a, philo a philosopher to lunch, that means you're gonna hear some philosophy. Uh, at some point, warning. <laughs> um, one of the things, that David mentioned was I used to run a Berkshire Hathaway company and I was very lucky in life and that Warren Buffett took me in when I was quite young sort of under his wing and became my great Dutch uncle in life and I could spend all the rest of the day telling you things Mr. Buffett taught me uh, all through my life but at some point when I ran a group of companies for him I really got a, the great uh, a lot, a, a, a lot of, of course, a lot of business education on very specific things. But his general point of view in business is that companies, people invent, entrepreneurs invent these wonderful businesses. And you can see somebody who invented something and they just, as he says, they hammer the idea all the way to heaven. They've got some one little idea and they just pound and pound and pound. But people, companies have a way, especially in the 70s and 80s, they had a way of forgetting what their business model is, was. And he was a great uh, critic of that. And a good example was Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, in his mind, is one of the great businesses in the world. You're selling colored sugar water for, that you make for nothing. You're saying it's one of the great products ever invented. But by the 1980s, Coca-Cola was out investing in copper mines in Latin America, in shrimp farming in the Gulf, and all kinds of things that he said, you know, what, they, they just, what is it about CEOs that make them get away from the business principles that let them build the business? Another thing he taught me, because I was sometimes, I was sort of in a clean up position, or sort of cleaning up some, some corporations, and it, uh, not that he owned, that there were suppliers and consumers and stuff of companies he owned. And so I had to deal with a lot of businesses that were on the edge of bankruptcy, or had just gone bankrupt. And then of course, Overstock is, I mean, we are the liquidator par excellence. We step into bankrupt businesses and liquidate them. And uh, reminds me of something Buffett taught me. I was once asked on ABC 2020, how do you feel about making money off of that? When, when the dot-com bust happened and all these businesses went bankrupt, we found this little business we had in Utah that was trying to get into the business of sort of excess inventory worked really well at cleaning up bankruptcies. And we went out and started cleaning up all these bankrupt dot-coms. And on ABC 2020, Chris Cuomo asked me once, how do you feel about making money off the distress of other businessmen? I said, well, Warren Buffett taught me that the first rule of business is, if you're not going to kick a man when he's down, when are you going to kick him? <laughs> but, well, anyway, anyway uh, he pointed out to me, I was once dealing with somebody in Texas, and I was having these surreal conversations. There was a fellow who, and, and he, this happens all the time in business. People go get to the edge of bankruptcy, and they don't seem to understand it. They don't understand, as he told me, until the sheriffs show up at the door and start you know, taking things. They just, so they can look at, you know, they can read the income statements, and the income statements say, and the balance sheet, that if everything just holds as it is, we're going to be bit bankrupt in three months. And the truth is nothing holds as it is as things go into bankruptcy. Everything tightens and runs on the bank and such, and, and it gets worse. And yet people would be right on the edge of bankruptcy, but talking to me about, and when you know, we're going to build this new wing on the building over here, and then we're going to they have all these plans. It's like they had not internalized what was happening. And I look at our country, and I sometimes feel the same way. Uh, you know, there's, I just saw something on Zero Hedge today about who has been buying uh, you, U.S. debt going back over 100 years. And it's really, you know, it's been about half of it has been the Social Security surplus. And, you know, the, the sources of buyers are now really, really shrinking. And, and there's not going to be anyone who can absorb the amount of, of paper that the United States Treasury is going to have to put on the market in the immediate future. 
So I think we're all waiting for something to break. So I wonder, what is it about our business model? What, is it, what was our business model that worked so well? And what have we forgotten? So I just want to take a few minutes to tell you, and I know it's kind of crass to talk about the United States as a business model, but I'm a business guy. I guess in some sense it makes, you know, it makes sense to say what, what to ask, what made the system work so well? Well, <clears throat> there was a Greek historian in the days of Rome, about 100 BC, named Polybius, a little over 100 BC, and, the, and he, uh, he had this theory of history that basically we rise out, and this influenced our founding. What I'm going to tell you is these, these different stories I tell you are, turn out to have influenced our founding fathers a great deal. Uh, his theory of history was that we start with sort of primitive, primitive madness, a king arises, but every form of gov government has a benevolent and a malignant form. And the king arises and he turns into a tyrant. So then the nobles take over. But the nobles degenerate to a, uh, what, an oligarchy. And then the people take over democracy and that turns into mob rule, which collapses and gets you back to the beginning of the cycle. And that the uh, way of breaking the cycle had to do with splitting up power. Uh, splitting up power so that there were different s centers uh, that could be trying to s solve the same problem in different ways. Uh, another key step on the rise of liberalism was, and I'm very fond of the story about the University of Salamanca 400 years ago, over 400 years ago, there were a group of scholastics, Je Jesuit and Dominican priests, who noticed, and arguably are the world's first economists since that guy in ancient Greece who wrote the book on economics, uh, they noticed inflation. They noticed that the silver and gold coming in from the new world created inflation. They became advocates of sound money. They saw the impossibility of socialist calculation. They, they have different terms for it, of course. Uh, the subjective theory of value, where if you study mainstream economics in American university, you get told that this idea, you know, it used to be that philosophers and economists would think about what is it that made something have value? Well, it must be some function of the labor put into it. And it was in the 1880s that somebody, Marshall at Cambridge, came up with the subjective theory of value, they say, that no, the, va the value of something is what other people will pay for it. Well, that actually didn't come in the 1880s. The Span these Spanish scholastics figured that out 400 years ago. And this set of thinking, this set of principles, uh, migrated to the eastern edge of Spain. And remember at the time in Europe, Europe was Spain with a couple islands in it, like France was an island in, in a, a Europe that was Spain. And these ideas moved to the eastern edge of Spain, the eastern edge, the eastern reign, the Österreich, or Austria. And they went into hibernation for 250 years, and then they came out 150 years ago as the Austrian School of Economics. Now, I know Murray Rothbard approved that interpretation of history. And there's a great fellow over in Spain now, Jesus, Hollis, uh, Jesus Huerta de Soto, who argues that. I don't know if that's yet universally accepted among Austrians, that it's really a Spanish. <laughs> uh, and Jefferson was very familiar with all this, by the way. Jefferson read the work of one of them, Marianus, the, who wrote the history of Spain, sent this book to all the founding fathers. And another key stop. So I'm just, again, describing the principles of our business model. Another key stop that does not get nearly the attention it deserves is Holland. Holland, uh, you know, we learn if you study philosophy in a university, you learn about social contract theory. Well, you, know, so you imagine if people were in some original position, what rules would they, you know, before they were born, or, you know, if people were in some situation before there was government, they would agree to some set of rules. So this approach to philosophy takes us. And says they, they would agree to some set of rules, and since that's what they would have agreed to in that situation, that's what we should live by now. Well, the first practitioner, Thomas Hobbes, said that what you would agree to is a real authoritarian state, hence the story of Leviathan. John Locke imagined a world much more tolerable, a much more minimalist government. Well, the truth is this social contract theory actually happened once. It happened when a bunch of Germans who didn't really want to live under anyone's rule migrated to these swamps on the northwest coast of Europe. And they had to go through the process. What are our rules going to be? We're going to cooperate, drain the swamps, have land, 
we're going to have to figure out what the benefits and burdens of social cooperation are. What are those rules? And, they, and what they evolved, what evolved there was this very limited state, an understanding that the government is not some overarching presence in the sky. It's just the first among equals. The, it's, uh, the Stadtholder, as they call them, is just the first among equals. It's just the, it's like a plumber that we hired to get some things done and organize us so we can go or organize the, the framework within which we can go about and pursue our life. Well, in this society, uh, there emerged a Catholic theo theologian, Erasmus, who <laughs> wrote on the, the first treaties on peace, the desirability of peace and tolerance, religious tolerance. And then political tolerance came along, and eventually this a great Jewish the, uh, thinker, Baruch Spinoza, who basically invented the modern idea of the self. Until then, history was just like what kings and princes and these kind of people did. He had, he, you can almost say modern psychology started in the work of Baruch Spinoza. And once you have this idea that of us as selves, we are beings whose consent matters. Out of that, of course, comes this form of government, of consent of the governed. And it's the consent of the governed that matters. And when I think of my days in, in uh, academic philosophy, and I look back, the common denominator of everybody who I, I seem to challenge or challenge me were people who wanted to uh, degrade the concept of consent. The, if, the authoritarians of today, the first step they have to make philosophically is to tell people what, what you think of as consent isn't real consent. It's been manipulated, it's been, so they want to do with the concept of consent. Well, the idea of consent of the government governed really evolved in Holland these 400 years ago. And then uh, this is where the, the wrong people get the credit. Uh, we had, there was a group of English Puritans. No, they weren't Puritans. They were not Puritans. What were they called? Brownian, the Brownian movement. They were not, they were more like Quakers. And they left England and they sailed and lived in Rotterdam for 20 years. And they, they imbibed all these principles. And, but they got fed up with the wicked and lascivious ways that Amsterdam was having on their youth. And they sailed to the New World, where we know them as the Pilgrims. And we give all this credit to the English for having, you know, this idea of religious toleration and stuff. It didn't, they didn't learn it in England. They learned it in Holland. And John Locke himself, whom all our founding fathers read, he sat out the English Revolution for three years in Amsterdam. And he lived for three years in Amsterdam. And again, he experienced a society, saw it that was based on these principles, how it all worked. And he went back and wrote the Second Treatise of Government, which is the book that influenced our founding fathers so much. So ultimately, this is the story of liberalism, the, the emergence of this business model, so to speak, of liberalism. That society based, an operating system based on these principles would, uh, would work, create the most flourishing human society. Well, what's, uh, what's happened? There's a, and, and the key principle of, that of Polybius that I wanted to draw, touch on is by decentralizing decision making uh, to different pol political centers of gravity, you get innovation. That's where innovation comes in in politics. You know, the truth is I don't know how to fix the US healthcare system and I don't know, maybe, maybe David knows, but I think, but how great it would be if we had a system where there were say 50 different laboratories all trying to fix it and then you would see which ones were doing best and other states would emulate it and such. That was the idea uh, embodied in our constitution. That this decentralization of power lets there be policy innovation. In the 19, what happened? What happened with all of this in my mind, I know this is a controversial point. Maybe uh, what happened was there was a very hard left Italian. Uh, he was a syndicalist, which is a, was a very hard left form of socialism. Uh, the only syndicalist I know of around today is Noam Chomsky. But it's the idea that society should be organized as social society, organized in syndicates and groups, kibbutzim or or unions or something, and then they, the marketplace doesn't sort out their differences, but some great office in Rome would solve, would, would get to some, would, would solve these differences. So this syndicalist, who was the editor of the Italian socialist newspaper, a hardcore socialist, 
uh, World War I breaks out. He fights in World War I. And after World War I, he says, he adds just a, a little bit to this. that just says those who have been fighting, those who have been bloodied in war, are the only ones who really can speak for the new Italy and such. Uh, but his fundamental view of how to organize society never changed. It was just this socialist view. Uh, this guy's name, of course, was Benito Mussolini. And Mussolini was, it's been like scrubbed out of our history. Mussolini was widely approved in the 20s and 30s in the United States uh, because he made the trains run on time. And there were, there, you know that Cole Porter song, uh, you're the tops, you're my great Houdini, you're the tops, you're my Mussolini. I mean, he was a, he was, it was only when he invaded Libya in 1935 that he was, became unpopular. And he was even asked once, what is, fa he was asked in 1936, what's fascism? He said, it's what you call the New Deal. Because what happened was <coughs> Roosevelt uh, had some people around him who, wired, wide, who widely admired Mussolini. And one of them, a general, I believe, was a fascist. I mean, not as a not as a derisive term. He self-identified as a fascist. fascist. He had spent 18 months in Italy studying Mussolini and blocking on his name for the second. But he came back and was a big architect of, of Roosevelt's programs. Well, these were unconstitutional. Fascism was unconstitutional. Uh, and Roosevelt got his new programs. The WPA and stuff got knocked down by the Supreme Court. And in 1936, the so Roosevelt said, uh, if, these, if this keeps happening, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put six new people on the Supreme Court. And there's nothing in the Constitution, incidentally, that says there's gotta be nine people. Started off with five people. And he said, I'm gonna put six new people. The, the, he, what his, his excuse was these justices are old and the workload's too much. I'm gonna give them six new justices. And of course, it would have made, put 15 people on the court, but he would have, and the Supreme Court came out for their spring term in 1937, and they folded, and they folded on everything. And they just started rubber stamping all this, all this stuff that had been, you can actually trace the intellectual image directly back to Benito Mussolini of what uh, FDR did. Uh, and they punched some holes in the Constitution. Uh, great uh, intellectual who writes on this, by the way, is Richard Epstein. Don't know if you've ever had Richard. Oh, is he? He's great. He's wrote a book called How Progressives Rewrote the Constitution, which is a beautiful book that traces this history. Uh, and there's one case I want to call out that uh, a Wickard versus Filburn was a case of Roosevelt wanted to set the prices of wheat and every, all the agricultural products in the United States. And there was a farmer in Iowa who grew some wheat in his own yard, consumed it at his own table. Uh, was charged, and I don't know if it was a criminal matter, but it got all the way to the Supreme Court. And the, on what, and the argument was, of course, where in the Constitution does it allow the federal government to reach in and say a guy growing uh, wheat cannot, uh, in his own yard, cannot eat it? And the Supreme Court found it in favor of the federal government and said under the Commerce Power Clause, they do have that power because otherwise the wheat that man ate would have had to have been bought in the marketplace and then it's a national marketplace for wheat and there's a, so under this very casuistic line of reasoning, they punched a hole in the Constitution and that through which has flooded this enormous administrative regulatory state that we now face. I'll point out that that was recently, in 2005, that very subject was revisited in another great Supreme Court case, uh, Gonzalez v. Reich, California, 2005, where a woman dying of leukemia under some new state laws that had allowed for the legalization of pot grew really on an experimental basis. Uh, you know, one marijuana plant that she then consumed the buds from. And this went to the Supreme Court, and it was exactly the same principle. And I've read, uh, I forget what the vote was, I think it was unusually strong that said the federal government does have the right to, uh, to, to say something about that. Clarence Thomas wrote a great dissent, and it's why I think that I actually love Clarence Thomas. I think he's the guy who understands the Constitution on the Supreme Court more than anyone. And, and if you ever get a chance, read his dissent in Gonzales v. Reich. It's about if the federal government can regulate this, they can regulate spelling bees, they can regulate anything. There's no meaning to these, to things like the Constitution. 
So it was these mistakes, these intellectual mistakes in the 30s and 40s that punched the hole in the Constitution, punched the hole in the business model, and set us on the course that we've been on for 80 years, 70, 80 years since. And I think it's working out about as one could expect. It's we all found, once, once all this power shifted to Washington to decide who winners and losers were, it became very rational for people to organize politically and put pressure on Washington to, so that the pinatas spilled goods in their favor. And we all organized. Society got organized politically from, say, the 30s up through the late 70s, where we all found ways we could join pressure groups and, get, and pressure Washington to kick more of the goodies our way. But then we all learned how that was happening to us, and we organized pressure groups to prevent that from happening to us, whatever type of group you belong to, until we all found a group that we could thieve and that we could loot, and they could never stop us. And that is the group of future human beings, because how can they ever organize to stop? And the political process has just successfully looted them uh, over two generations. Uh, and it seems to me the common denominator of whether we're talking about Social Security or Medicare or the environment is that we found a group we could all loot their well-being and they could not stop us. And now the future has come along. I just read uh, the other day that the average person who's 65 is going to take $371,000 more out of Social Security than they put in. And the average person who's 22 is going to pay 450 odd thousand more into Social Security than they get out. So it's just turned into a huge mechanism for the past to loot the future. So whenever I see you young folks under 40, I look at you and I just feel like apologizing on behalf of all that you know, we looted your future. And it was, I, I, I'm not sure they've completely woken up to, uh, to that. So how do we get back on track? To me, the most fundamental things in any society the things that, it's like civilization is this great ship with two propellers on it. And there are two propellers that move it forward. You gotta do a bunch of other things right. You gotta have a good clean hull and stuff, but there's really two propellers. And those two propellers are how you form human capital and how you marry human capital to financial capital. Those are the, that's the propulsion on society. And how you form human capital is of course education and how you marry it to financial capital is Wall Street. So the two subjects that I've spent the mo m most of my life thinking about and, and saying being activist about have been Wall Street and education. I won't go into, unless in Q&A, I can tell you a little bit about a, a somewhat famous fight I had with Wall Street about 10 years ago. Uh, <laughs> but uh, education. Now, I've never seen something that would be this easy to solve. Not in the sense of, I know what the right curriculum is, uh, I think that uh, I'm, ag I'm agnostic, actually, on the specifics of how to solve it. Do you want, do you want whole word le learning? Do you want Afrocentric-based curriculum do you, in the inner city? Do you want math-based? You know, I, I don't know. But I know that it's not going to be found from the top down. It's not going to be found from a, in a, within a system. You're never going to have the innovation and the pursuit of successful or let's say the, the, uh, that, that success uh, gets replicated and emulated in a top-down system. We have, last time I did the math was two years ago, we were spending $850 billion in America. And this is out of the federal, the federal they publish something every year on the state of education, condition of education in America. They get all this data together. And it's kind of it's funny. They don't organize the data in a way that makes these things leap off the page at you. You've got to spend, spend a little bit of time. But it turns out that we spend $850 billion educating about 51 million kids. So it's just under $19,000 per kid in public schools. Now, if you ask each state, states will tell you, well, we, don't, you know, we only spend 14,000. We spent 16,000 such. Well, not everyone in the room can be shorter than the average height in the room. Someone is spending over that, but states have ways of lying about it because they don't count 
well, they don't, uh, they don't count the, the teacher pension or they don't count the cost of building a school. And there's a guy, Cato, who has sort of disaggregated all this and come up with a way you can see. And it actually is eighteen, nineteen thousand dollars $19,000 per student. Uh, the, the real, dan and so the solution that Milton proposed 50 years ago uh, was that you would take half of that money, any child who wanted to could take half of that money and leave in the form of a voucher and go buy the best private education they could. Uh, seems like, uh, you know, in a, there's a principle in economics of Pareto efficiency. In that world, the children who leave with the vouchers, they're better off or else they wouldn't do it. And the children who stay are better off because there's more money per child left over in the system. And the taxpayer is better off because the taxpayer has achieved a higher per pupil spending with no tax increase. So every party in the transaction is better off other than, of course, a guild. And the guild is just doing what guilds, and by guilds, I don't just mean the union, the teachers union itself. We have to remember in the education industry, there are layers that most people never think about. Behind that high school teacher that you know and love, there's the district, the county, the state, and the federal levels. And they eat up I believe about 50% of all the funding. One, I have finally found a way to get through to teachers because teachers, of course, you get talking vouchers and generally public school teachers, it's, uh, you know, they get, they, don't, they typically send hecklers anywhere I show up and speak. I'm waiting for someone to burst out of the audience and heckle me. Um, I found a way to get through to them. By their own data, by the NEA, there's 26 kids in, every in the average class in America. So a different way of saying that is there's close to $500,000 of funding for every classroom in America. Last I checked, the teachers aren't making $500,000. They're making an average of about $55,000. And with benefits, it brings that up to about $75,000. And of course, to have 1,000 square feet and have it heated and lighted and somebody sweeping it and such costs you something, call it $25,000 to be generous. You can sort of see where $100,000 of costs are in the system. And I've, I've come to, I have finally found the one way to get the light bulb to go off for public school teachers in general is to point out that there's $500,000 of funding coming into the system to support your job. How much are you seeing? How much, and where's the rest of it going? And that's how you get people to see that there's this huge bureau, you know. Now anytime you try to talk about that bureaucracy, of course what they do is they trot out the local high school teacher and oh, he, he hates the teachers and stuff. I love the teachers. They just do not want to talk about this $400,000 on top of the teacher. And uh, it's my contention you can't. I've, I've been in business all my life, and I've fixed or tried to fix all kinds of broken bureaucracies. And there's lots of different ways, and Buffett taught me different, different approaches to different types of problems. Uh, but the one thing that is, is so certain, you can't fix situations like that from the top down. There's no difference in orders that the people planning in Moscow, planning the agricultural system for the farmers in Siberia, doesn't matter how smart the people you put in that department in Moscow and how they cha change the rules, it never gets better until you turn things upside down and you have it driven by the consumer, you have it driven by choice. And that's, of course, what the, the whole mission of vouchers is. Uh, that you're, you're shifting that choice into the parents' hands, and then as they make their choices, that's what will crumble, this enormous block of expense that's eating education alive, as, as they just defect from the state system and go to their own. There's a political aspect to this that I never, ever push, because I think the argument for vouchers stands on its own. It's economically sound for all the reasons I just said, but uh, the political aspect is, as Milton also used to say, a socialist school system will teach socialist values and a free market school system will teach free market values. Uh, our school system has become a means of indoctrinating people in a, in a collectivist, uh, in, in, indoctrinating people not in the principles that made, not in the business, uh, the, the business model that made the country work, but in another set of of principles that evolved in the last decades, and we all know what they are. And it seems that more and more the, 
that has come to be the function of the school system, this, this indoctrination in a worldview. Uh, if we could break, if we could provide choice, uh, and you could break that and have a, even if 15 or 20 percent of kids defected, I think it would have, well put it this way, I think it gives the, the voices of authoritarianism and collectivism an enormous edge, an enormous edge over us, and that they get to indoctrinate people in the public school system, and only when people are sort of 18, 20, 22, getting out of college do we even have a chance of reaching them. So there is a, there's a political reason to want to break it up, but besides the political reason, just on economic principles, it saves money, you get it, and on, you get, you're gonna, we would get a much, this much better school system. Just like if we had government running all the, you know, if, if people, Milton used to also like to point out, we give money to, uh, we say poor people shouldn't starve, we give them food, uh, food stamps, and that's great. Love that there are food stamps, but how about if somebody said you have to spend your food stamps at a government-run commissary? Presumably we would say, well, government doesn't have any special edge in producing or distributing food. Why don't we take that same logic to education? Find that government is going to pay for everyone's education. Why do we insist that you have to spend what the government give, you know, the funds that they're providing at a government-run school? They don't have any edge in producing education. So to me, you know, Wall Street's a different subject, but to me, the, the, the policy that matters the most to me is fi fixing education. Because I think if we could fix education through a choice system, that all kinds of problems that have bedeviled us would wash out in the space of a generation, which isn't too long a time. And if we, if we don't fix it there, no matter what you do, you know, some kids graduate from high school with a, a thimble full of human capital, and some kids don't graduate at all, and other kids graduate with a bucket and they go on to college. And of course that creates these enormous social disparities downstream. And it seems that a great deal of political voice concern, or discourse concerns these downstream effects. And it doesn't matter how many band-aids we put on it, until you fix it upstream, it's never gonna be fixed. But if we can fix it upstream, which we would do through choice, these problems would start washing out over 10 years to a generation. So that's, I think, how we get our business model back on track. I've tried to run through the history of, cap of liberalism, where it went wrong, and uh, to me, the main event on, on how to get us back on track. So I think that just in general, if we, the, the more we can push back against the centralization of decision making in Washington and break things up to the states, the, uh, the higher our chances of being able to innovate our way out of where we are. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you very much.